Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again. We have our next lecture on our World War II series. Uh, today, we are going to see the involvement of the United States after the attack on Pearl Harbor. We'll see the impacts that that has here at home, both in terms of manufacturing for the war effort, but also in terms of some political actions that really serve to diminish civil rights. We're going to see the, uh, the arrest and internment of Japanese American citizens. Uh, so one of the, the darkest chapters in American history, uh, without a doubt. I will warn you, I recorded this uh, about a year ago when we went into the spring lockdown of, uh, of 2020. Uh, so if I make any comments about what's happening at that time, uh, just kind of be aware of that. But the information is still the exact same. So please, if you have any questions at all, as always, please don't hesitate to email me. I hope you guys enjoyed today's lecture. All right. Well, um, so the war has begun uh, in the Pacific. Um, and, you know, we, we've talked about the, uh, the fighting there. Make sure that we're still recording. Yep, we're good. Um, we, we've talked about how the, the Japanese have been at war really since 1931. Remember that uh, they invaded. Uh, China, specifically Manchuria. Uh, they had taken Korea previously as a colony uh, earlier on, but uh, you know the Chinese had been fighting at, at the point we're about to, to pick up the story for about uh, a decade, a better part of a decade. So, um, you know, they are going to be running low on some major resources. And uh, if you remember that simulation we did uh, a couple weeks ago, um, where you guys acted as if you were a country uh, making decisions and ultimately you got placed in a similar scenario uh, to what Japan was facing at this time, uh, running low on resources uh, and especially some of the policies we're going to see coming from the United States, how that began to affect the Japanese war effort. Um, but remember that, that ultimately uh, the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, you know, it kind of made sense when you took all of that together, that Japan had been fighting for an extremely long time, that they were running low on resources, especially after this embargo we're about to discuss. Um, it, it made sense that this was coming, but I'll tell you, this is a major turning point of the war uh, because with the introduction of the United States into this war, and remember, the people of the U.S. have not wanted to be in this war. Um, we talked uh, last time about you know, how 70% uh, of Americans had regretted World War I, um, and that is still very real to them. The, the America First uh, organization pushing the idea of, of uh, you know, this anti-war message, uh, pacifism on the rise. Um, so this attack, though, changes everything. Um, the America First movement goes out the window. I mean, we are attacked at Pearl Harbor, uh, and it changes everything. We get involved in this war uh, head on, and um, I'll tell you, it's... it's uh, it's the, the jolt that the allies needed. Um, I don't know if they win the war with, without U.S. support. Um, so anyways, let's go ahead and jump into it. So we'll start there with, uh, with letter A, uh, Japan expands into Asia. Uh, and I, I do want to pause and just remind you that uh, for students watching, um, guys, please make sure that you are taking notes just like you would in class. Uh, I'll remind you that at the end of uh, the week, um, I will have you guys posting your notes so I can see that you've been following along as we've been reviewing these topics. Um, so it is up to you to do that. Um, so please make sure you continue to take handwritten notes, um, not, not a lot of type. Uh, okay, so Japan expands into Asia. So that initial invasion in 1931 into Manchuria, uh, what we've seen over the, la the last few years is that uh, they're pushing deeper and deeper into China. Uh, we had talked, uh, talked about the, the rape of Nanking uh, a couple weeks ago and just the horrific uh, nature in which the Japanese took over that major city. Um, so by, by 1940, um, Japan has made its way down into uh, French Indochina. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor down here, but uh, French Indochina, they've, they've even launched attacks here. Um, and today this is Vietnam. Um, so after the French leave, they, they do uh, rename it Vietnam. But uh, by 1940, uh, Japan's invaded French Indochina um, to, to try and stop imports uh, into China, to try and stop the... Uh, uh, basically, the the backing up of the the Chinese government. Um, so you know the but the war is um, uh, it, it's costly for the Japanese, especially in terms of resources. Um, they uh, the the leadership 
uh, estimated that uh, according to their best guess, um, uh, especially after the, the U.S. oil embargo, um, which I'm about to discuss, um, after that point, they, uh, they have less than two years of oil uh, reserves remaining. They're going to have to make some, some choices. So like I said, that, that U.S. oil embargo, I'll remind you that uh, an embargo is when a nation uh, stops trading with another nation. So the most famous one, I believe, that, that the United States has is with Cuba. All right? You probably heard Cuban cigars are illegal. Um, that, that's why, is because of the embargo that was placed during the Cold War. Well, in this scenario, the United States government places an oil embargo on the nation uh, and empire of Japan. Um, we cut off all oil supplies. Now, that might shock you to hear that we were selling oil to the Japanese. Um, but remember, we were neutral up until this point. We, we had passed a series of neutrality acts. Um, so, you know, even though we had uh, started to, to cut off reserves to uh, aggressive nations, um, and Japan was one of those, um, we solidified the, the policy that we would stop selling oil to them in 1940. So it's at that point that the Japanese really start to, to really take stock and realize that they're going to be in some deep trouble come soon if, uh, if they no longer have any oil. So um, they're going to be looking to expand. Uh, once again, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but I'm highlighting the, uh, the southern area of the, the Netherlands, uh, the Netherland Indies. Um, so this area that today is Indonesia and the Philippines, all this stuff, um, especially for uh, uh, this area down here. Uh, very, um, uh, there's some oil reserves that the Japanese had their eyes on, um, but here's the deal. You cannot attack those areas out of the blue unless you want repercussions uh, from the U.S. Navy. Uh, remember that this time the Philippines is uh, a U.S. colony. Okay, they are a U.S. territory. They uh, they are owned by the United States, and we have thousands of servicemen in 1940 that are located in the Philippines. If the Japanese start launching attacks around the Philippines and we're basically surrounded, uh, that's going to put us into a, a tough situation that we will probably have to strike back upon. So um, the Japanese understand this and. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of working backwards here. Okay. So if we got to get the oil, then we have to neutralize the threat. And that threat is the United States Navy. On December 7th, 1941, uh, the, the empire of Japan would launch an attack, uh, on the United States. Um, it, uh, began around 8 AM, uh, Hawaiian time. And, uh, this attack was launched, um, from over six, well, from six aircraft carriers with over 350 uh, aircrafts um, that were sent in multiple waves. There were actually two waves of aircraft that came and attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, if you look at the photograph in the, the bottom right, this is actually a photograph from a Japanese aircraft during the attack. You can see here what's called Battleship Row. Uh, and you can see that a couple of these dive bombers have actually uh, launched their torpedoes and are attacking these battleships. Those battleships were the main target. Uh, that is what they were, were going after. Um, if, uh, if the Japanese could take out our battleships and take out the vast majority of our Navy, um, you know, they're, they're looking, they really thought that um, they could take us out of the war. Their estimates were, um, were, were about two years, I believe. Um, I, I will tell you that even though they are somewhat successful in this attack, uh, their estimate is way off. Um, Thankfully, many of our aircraft carriers were out to sea that day, and um, instead of our Navy taking two years to recover, uh, it'll take about three months. But back to the uh, the attacks themselves. Um, the uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. I I, I do want to mention just uh, I guess personal story here. My uh, my grandfather um, had had joined a, the Navy as a as a young man before the war began, uh, and he found himself stationed at Pearl Harbor. Um, he uh, was in the Navy um, and uh, was, was actually there at Pearl Harbor that day. Um, the, uh, I believe from what I've been told, uh, the ships down here on the, the lower left-hand corner, I believe that second one was uh, uh, the Sicard, which, uh, which was the ship my grandfather was on. Um, but I remember as a little boy, um, uh, him telling me stories about, uh, you know, seeing the 
the Japanese zeros going overhead and, uh, you know, the, the ships being on fire, they basically checked into their ship. And then, uh, since they weren't directly being attacked, they were sent to go help other ships. Um, you know, I remember as a little boy being, being fascinated by that, you know, uh, and as I've gotten older, I've, I've, uh, remembered that story differently because, you know, as a little boy, you're, <laughs> you're wrapped up in the excitement of, uh, you know, what, what's happening. Um, I think it was later as an adult when I, when my mom told me that a lot of the stories my grandfather uh, shared with me, she had never heard. And uh, um, you know, the, the only reasoning there that um, you know, many of those stories were, were probably too painful um, in, uh, in the years, le you know, following these events for my grandfather to share. It wasn't until later life. Uh, sadly, my grandfather's passed on, but um uh, I, I vividly remember that, but uh, as I said, as I've gotten older, um, you know, I've thought about the fact that, uh, you know, um, this this was a this was a tragedy that he was experiencing as a, as a young man, um, you know, to actually witness um, the you know the murder of, of U.S. Uh, soldiers sailors during this period. Um, you know, it was absolutely. Uh, tragic. And, uh, you know, there are many men, those that did survive this day that uh, were scarred for the rest of their lives. They, they never forgot it. They never, never did. Um, you know, I, and I'll take this opportunity to remind you that, you know, we always talk about war in, uh, you know, with nice little bookends, you know, well, the war started this year and it ended this year. Um, that is not the case for uh, anyone that's actually involved in the war, for the soldiers, for the civilians that encounter war, um, for the, the, the people that are wounded, uh, that carry, you know, uh, a loss of a limb with them for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, war is a, a tragic thing. And at the end of it, uh, even though there may be uh, heroics and there may be exciting tales that emerge, at the end of the day, it's about uh, death and destruction. Um, so, uh, I guess, uh, the big lesson, uh, is always to, to remember war should be a last option. Um, we, we always need to try and, and work through things diplomatically because, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, war is necessary sometimes. I mean, the Japanese empire, uh, the Nazi empire, they had to be destroyed. Um, but, uh, you know, could actions and diplomacy have taken place beforehand to, to try and end that? I would like to think so. But um, again, kind of second guessing there. But war always ends in, in deaths and, and often of, uh, of, of the innocent. So um, just uh, my soapbox there. So thanks for dealing with that. Um, now, let's talk about the impact uh, that the, the attack on Pearl Harbor had. Um, there were of those eight battleships. We'll start there that I talked about earlier. Um, they were all damaged, uh, first of all, but uh, only four of them were sunk. Now, that's a tremendous loss. I mean, that represents a, a good percentage of the battleships that the U.S. had in its stock at this time. But, um, but still, um, you know, that the fact that the Japanese were unable to sink all of our battleships, um, that our aircraft carriers were, were out to sea, you know, we really escaped this um, quite lucky uh, in terms of loss of ships. Um, now, sadly, this would be one of the um, uh, worst days in American history for loss of American lives. Um, there would be 2,403 Americans uh, that would lose their lives, uh, that were killed in the attacks. And, um, you know, I've um, just a, another quick soapbox, you know, I, I've always said uh, I, one reason I love history is because I always think about the what ifs, you know. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this that the Japanese had sent in two waves of fighters uh, into attack Pearl Harbor and um, uh, also mentioning my grandfather down on the ground actually helping put out fires and, you know, rescue guys out of the out of the uh, the bay. Um I always wonder what, what happens if they send in that, that third wave, um, you know, ultimately and there's a very real opportunity and chance that, uh, my grandfather could have been, um, you know, number 2,404. Uh, uh, and if that's the case, I'm not here lecturing to you guys today. That's for sure. Um, you know, about how much history can change on, on a single decision. Uh, you know, a, a Japanese, uh, general, uh, you know, 80 years ago, uh, making a pivotal decision that um, per, perhaps even uh, led to this moment. So um, history is an amazing thing. So anyways, um, 
like I said, the uh, the Japanese somewhat successful attack, but uh, ultimately it it really doomed them because it brought us into the war. Uh, they did not damage our navy nearly as as much as they thought they would, um, and uh, they basically were able to unite the American people behind this cause um, immediately. Moving on to letter C, uh, the Bataan Death March. Um, the exact same day uh, that Pearl Harbor, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor was launched, December 7th, 1941, uh, there were other attacks. Uh, in fact, if you listen to FDR's address, um, he says, uh, he goes through and he lists all the places that, that had been attacked alongside Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, there were attacks in uh, the Philippines, okay, uh, which is what we're about to discuss. There were attacks in, in British holdings of Malaya, Singapore. Hong Kong, all those areas are attacked on December 7th. So this was a well-coordinated, uh, very broad attack that spanned literally, um, you know, hundreds of miles. Um, the, the Philippines, though, as I said, the U.S. had a number of uh, U.S. soldiers that were there based in the Philippines. It was uh, one of our largest uh, military bases uh, outside the continental United States. And uh, the Japanese laid an assault on the Philippines in which the United States were, were able to hold off for about four months. Um, but in April, uh, the, uh, the American forces alongside the Filipino forces, they would have to surrender uh, to the Japanese. Um, there were approximately uh, somewhere between 60 and 80 thousand uh, Filipino and American soldiers that were taken captive as POWs. Um, and if you look in the picture in the lower left-hand corner, uh, you will see here uh, a photo taken um, from this event. This is days after uh, the Japanese have uh, conquered the Philippines. And you can see the smile on the, the faces of the soldiers, uh, the Japanese soldiers. Um, as for the Americans and the, the Filipinos that uh, were taken captive, uh, the Japanese displayed uh, some of that, that brutality I've been discussing um, in, this, in this moment. Uh, they took their captives uh, and they forced them to march, some of them up to 60 miles um, to what amount to, to concentration camps. Um, and these, uh, this forced march um, uh, it was extremely brutal. You know, we're, we're talking, um, you know, extreme heat. Uh, we're talking about again, 60 miles, you know, um, you know, trying to, to walk from Kansas city to, I don't know, basically Columbia, Missouri. Um, many of these guys, uh, you know, are low on supplies. Some of them didn't even have shoes on. Uh, if you, uh, if you were an American POW here that, uh, tripped and fell, um, or, um, you know, tried to run. Uh, the Japanese killed you on the spot. Uh, there was no question. In fact, they would even kill people just for sport, um, just just uh, for fun. And we saw some of that with the descriptions of the rape of Nanking. Absolutely uh, brutal mentality that the Japanese army had uh, at this time. 10,000 Americans would die uh, in the Bataan Death March. And uh, again, one of the deadliest events in, in U.S. history. Um, those that did make it uh, to the end and were placed in those camps, many of them were in those camps for the remainder of the war. Many of them died uh, in those camps because of lack of food, uh, lack of water, lack of sanitation. Uh, many were tortured um, and many were executed. So, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the beginning of World War II, again, we, we like to remember all the heroics and, you know, knowing that ultimately we're going to win this war. We love talking about that stuff. Um, we're seeing a tremendous amount of blood and, um, and death uh, in the opening scenes of this war for the United States. Um, and we always need to keep that in, in mind. Moving on to uh, the, the next page here. Uh, let's take a look at what's happening here in, uh, back home in the United States as uh, uh, this war starts to play out. Um, the domestic impacts of, of the war. And first I want to start off with the political uh, impacts. Um, in February 1942, that's three months after Pearl Harbor, uh, President FDR makes one of what I consider his, uh, his worst decisions as uh, president. And that is signing 
uh, Executive Order 9066. Okay, I would write that down. Executive Order 9066. Uh, and what this executive order, which in some ways kind of amounts to a law, um, you know, it had to be followed. Um, what this executive order did, if you look in the bottom uh, portion here, uh, this flyer uh, kind of says it all. Uh, it instructed all persons of Japanese ancestry. Um, notice I did not say Japanese citizen. Okay, these are American citizens that uh, this law applies to, that this executive order applies to. Um, what this called for was the detention, the arrest, and the concentration uh, in internment camps of all Japanese American citizens on the West Coast. Um, it's shocking to, to think uh, that this would happen because many of the people that we are discussing here, um, you know, all of them, for the most part, are, are American citizens. And some of them are third and fourth generation American citizens. Um, you know, this would be, uh, you know, I know many of you, um, you know, in my classroom probably have, uh, you know, regardless of, of where you're from, whether, you know, and family ancestries from Germany or Japan, whatever, you know, imagine us going to war today with a nation like, like Germany. And uh, they passed a law saying that anyone uh, with German blood uh, in their family tree uh, is now being detained. Okay. Um, now, now there was, um, there was fear and, and I, the fear is the big theme here um, because uh, this, this executive order is put in place uh, because they are afraid that there are uh, Japanese uh, loyal uh, people on the West Coast that are communicating with the Japanese. Um, they believe that there may be spies uh, along the West Coast. Uh, and this, this executive order is signed uh, to try and prevent any coordination between those on the ground and uh, in the United States and, and uh, the Japanese empire. In reality, uh, there was extremely little uh, disloyalty among the Japanese Americans. Um, there, there were very, uh, I, I can't say that I've ever even come across any examples of Japanese spies on the ground. Um, I know there were some at Pearl Harbor. But in California, I, I can't say that I've ever come across a single uh, example of that. Um, so think of, think of what's about to happen here. All told, there's going to be um, hundreds of thousands of American citizens uh, that will be sent off to internment camps, okay, concentrated in certain areas. Now, I, I do want to pause and, and say that... Um, you know, the, comparison, the comparisons to uh, the concentration camps of the Nazis, um, this is where it ends. Um, those were death camps. And, uh, and, and yes, while many, uh, there, there were some Japanese Americans that died in these camps, uh, please understand that these internment camps were not execution camps. They were not death camps um, uh, that were put in place to, to actually wipe these people out. They were being held um, uh, against their will, um, because of their ancestry. So, uh, I, I don't want to have any parallels with what's happening over in Europe at this exact same time. Um, let's look at some of these numbers though. Um, there were about 110,000, uh, American, uh, citizens on the West coast of Japanese American ancestry. Um, 62% of them were full American citizens. Okay, meaning that they had some of them have lived in the U.S. for generations. Eighty thousand of those were what we call uh, NICE, okay, which uh, N I S E I, uh, excuse me, the pronunciation there, which uh, were second generation, okay, second generation, or uh, Sansi, which were third generation, okay, eighty thousand of the 110,000 were second or third generation. These people had been here. This is the only home that they have ever known. They were born in America, just like you and me. And these people were arrested because of uh, who their grandparents were. Um, to me, this is one of the darkest chapters in, in U.S. history. Um, 
but it, it is such an important lesson for us to, to understand the, the fear uh, out of this attack from Pearl Harbor, what it turned around and, and uh, you know, directly led to the violation of these people's civil rights. Um, it, it's disgusting. And we have to be careful uh, because when we are fearful, we often give up our civil rights. Um, and we've seen this time and time again. Uh, we saw it in, in Germany, as we lectured earlier, after the burning of the Reichstag. Um, and I would argue you saw it after 9-11 uh, with the passage of the Patriot Act. Um, you know, these kind of things happen when we uh, are fearful. Um, we often sign away our rights and we have to be well aware of that, especially at a time where I'm lecturing from home because of the coronavirus. So uh, let's make sure that we, we keep rational heads and we follow instructions, but uh, make sure that that our politicians uh, don't uh, don't begin violating our civil rights in any way. All right. The uh, camps. Uh, let's talk about these camps. Uh, there were 10 internment camps that existed throughout the western part of the United States. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them, uh, a couple of the largest. Uh, Tule Lake, T-U-L-E uh, Lake, and that was in California. Um, there were almost 19,000 people detained. That was the largest uh, of, of the internment camps. Um, Postone, uh, which was in Arizona, uh, that was another large one, um, about 18,000, and that is P-O-S-T-O-N. Um, again, I apologize if pronunciations are off, but uh, about 18,000 people in those. Now, you might be thinking, you know, how could they get away with this? How could they just arrest tens of thousands of uh, American citizens um, who have shown no ill will towards the United States, who have uh, there's no evidence uh, that they are directing any attacks. There's nothing. Um, how can you just arrest them? Well, it was challenged. Uh, this did go before the Supreme Court in, uh, in 1944, towards the end of the war. There, uh, there would be a Japanese American that would sue the U.S. government, and it made its way to the courts. Uh, and that court case became known as Korematsu versus the United States. Um, Perhaps not shockingly, uh, I don't know, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the Japanese American internment uh, order was constitutional because it was labeled a wartime defense measure. They saw it as reasonable uh, within wartime. Uh, you know, the reasoning here, um, there. Sadly, I think uh, there are many examples um, throughout our history in which we have um, uh, basically taken a timeout on civil rights in wartime. Um, we, we saw this, I mean, even Abraham Lincoln signed off to, to end habeas corpus during the Civil War. Um, we saw, uh, I mean, American Revolution. We saw John Adams sign, uh, sign bills that um, basically made it illegal to speak out against the government. Uh, um, we saw, um, yeah, there's been a lot of World War I, uh, same thing. Wilson signed off on laws that, that uh, silenced uh, the freedom of the press. So this is sadly just the next stage in the long list of um, civil rights violations. But uh, shockingly, uh, the, the Korematsu decision did keep the internment camps open for another uh, year or two. Uh, and I will say that, that they were wrong in this decision. I think that that's quite evident. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can believe President Ronald Reagan uh, in the 1980s. Um, he would uh, basically say as much. And in fact, uh, the Japanese American survivors of this and their families did receive uh, reparations um, after uh, it was decided that this was an illegal um, attack on, on their civil rights. Um, so, and rightfully so. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a painful um, part of our history, but uh, man, it's one that we have to look at if we want to avoid this kind of stuff in the future. I, I will also mention, it says Germans and Italians in the United States. Um, there were some Germans and Italians that got uh, wrapped up, uh, especially on the East Coast. There were some that um, were arrested. Uh, numbers were not nearly uh, similar. There were, as far as I could see, only about 5,000 people that uh, were interned on the East Coast that were either German or uh, Italian. Um, there were regulations put on, on those people, though. Uh, some of them had to carry IDs. Um, 
that uh, their property could be seized. I mean, there were definitely attacks going on uh, on them, but just not as visible as what we see with the Japanese uh, American internment camps. Um, the, the final section here, and this will be our last slide, uh, the social impacts. Um, you know, what happens when you send millions of men, you tell them to, to leave their jobs and go fight overseas? Well, uh, those jobs still have to be done. And, um, and for the most part, they were picked up by uh, two groups uh, within American society. Uh, first of all, women are going to be going to work in massive numbers, and they're going to be doing jobs that they've never been allowed to do before. Uh, you see the picture there of, of Rosie the Riveter. We'll talk about her in a, in a second. Also, minorities. Um, uh, you know, this is sadly still the time of, of uh, you know, the Jim Crow era and, uh, you know, segregation laws made it impossible for many minorities to, uh, to find uh, good jobs throughout the country. But uh, again, when you have a massive evacuation of millions of, uh, of white males uh, in particular, um, those jobs do become open and many minorities find work in areas that they couldn't uh, have, have done so before. Uh, and I'll, I'll take a time out here because this war is going to have tremendous impacts on the civil rights. I mean, uh, era, the, the modern civil rights era begins, uh, after these, these millions of African Americans come back from the war and realize that, uh, you know, when they were dining in the cafes of Paris, uh, you know, they were treated like any other person that walked through the door, but yet when they get back home, um, they're treated like dirt, less than dirt. Um, we're, we're going to talk about, um, uh, you can see the picture in the upper right-hand corner. We're going to talk about a veteran who in his first days coming back from service, I mean, would literally be attacked and tortured, blinded um, because of this. So um, we are on the cusp of, uh, of another major change in the United States, and it's, it's starting right here. The seeds are being planted for the modern civil rights uh, movement. But um, let's talk uh, at the beginning there, uh, women at work, Rosie the Riveter, uh, women begin working in industrial settings throughout the country. Um, you know, while men may be flying the airplanes and the tanks, uh, driving the tanks, um, the, the women are building them back home. Uh, the number of women in the workplace uh, rose from uh, about 13 million at the beginning of the war to 19 million by the end of the war. Um, so you see uh, basically a, a 35% increase uh, in, in women at work during this period. Uh, also, like I said, minorities are going to find an opportunity that they've never had before here. Uh, America is segregated, and we have to remind ourselves of that. Um, uh, that, that evil would not go away for, for quite a long time. But uh, minorities, uh, and, and I should mention this, the military is still segregated as well. Blacks and whites were not supposed to fight next to each other. Uh, that's crazy to me that you know, we could be fighting this war uh, under the banner of, of democracy and freedom and equality, all that good stuff. But yet uh, uh, we're telling our black soldiers to, to, to head over to the front of the lines there to get in front of us to take the bullets. Uh, I, I, I wish I had time to, to talk about more uh, examples, but um, you know, the, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen um, were uh, one of the most famous celebrated uh, squadron of pilots. Um, and they, uh, you know, previously black men were not uh, given, uh, you know, that, that right to, to fly planes and, uh, you know, to fight in that way. Um, but they were proven to be capable. Uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, perhaps more so than anybody else, um, proved that African Americans could uh, not only fight, but become the best uh, uh, that, that we had to offer. And the Tuskegee Airmen, um, there's been multiple movies made about them, just a, a heroic bunch that, uh, um, uh, fought many uh, battles for the United States. Um, moving down to the, the Zoot Suit Riots, uh, and this is kind of a, a sadder case within this, this uh, context here. Um, you know, as you had thousands of uh, young white males that have either been drafted or signed up for the war, as they're moving out to their locations to be shipped off, um, sometimes they clashed with populations that they never encountered before. Um, and in particular in California, uh, in Los Angeles, you had uh, a series of what were called the Zoot Suit Riots. Um, the Zoot Suit was kind of a popular uh, 
uh, wear for um, many Latino uh, men in, in uh, Southern California at the time, big baggy clothing, big baggy suits um, that, uh, um, you know, were very identifiable, long chain wallets, things like that. Um, and for uh, days, these riots actually lasted for days. They're uh, 10 days of, of chaos and violence um, that, uh, that happened in the spring of 1943 um, after uh, some, some young Latinos had actually been uh, attacked by U.S. servicemen um, uh, who were about to ship out. Uh, so there, there was some clashing there between minority groups. So there's still a lot of racial struggle happening here in the United States, even as America is going off to fight this war um, in, in the name of democracy. Um, moving down to the civil rights impact. Um, there, like I said, we are on the cusp of a major era of U.S. history, uh, and there are some positive things that are coming out with it. We're seeing the, the beginning of the ends of segregation right here. Executive Order 8802. Uh, was signed by FDR. And um, what this did was outlaw discrimination in the war industries. Okay, so if you went to work in a factory that made tanks or planes, um, you could not be discriminated against based off your skin color. Okay, now it doesn't, obviously, that doesn't apply to all society, um, it, it, but, but they were having too many problems, uh, you know, at a time where you couldn't really take time to argue, you know, black and white, we got to make tanks, we got to make bombs for these guys to drop. Um, you know, so we got to get to work and FDR understood that passes this order. Um, and, uh, this is one of the first desegregation orders that we see and anti-discrimination orders that we'll see from the, the government. Um, it also created what was called the fair employment practices, uh, commission, which um, kind of established a board that would investigate claims that uh, there had not been fair employment practices uh, occurring or there had been violations, discriminations, things like that. So uh, that was passed in an executive order. Uh, and immediately following the war, 1948, that's three years after the war would end, we see that President Truman would actually desegregate the military. So, um, you know, for, for all minorities that were fighting. And it wasn't just African-Americans. We, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about Native Americans fighting uh, later on. But, uh, you know, this uh, the, the proving, uh, you know, the, the fact that they are willing to fight and die for this nation, uh, three years later, uh, Truman will desegregate the military. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, again, we're seeing those, uh, the, those pillars of Jim Crow come toppling down. Um, the final section I want to discuss today is, uh, the economic impact and, uh, uh, you know, again, this focus on what's happening here at home, um, war bonds. One big difference between the United States and the rest of the world really is, uh, the vast amount of capital of money that we have in the United States. Now, while most of that is in the hands of individuals, uh, the U S government, um, obviously has an opportunity to raise funds among our civilians, whereas other poor nations don't have that, right? Russia, they're not doing that kind of thing. Uh, you know, massive poverty there. Um, but we are able to supply, we're able to supply weapons to basically all of the allies uh, because we are able to raise money from our own citizens through war bonds. So um, these bonds were used um, to, to help pay for the war, um, but the government would offer bonds. Uh, the most common was a $25 bond that you could purchase for $18.75. And uh, a few years later, if you held on to it, you could cash it in then for $25. So you, you hand over your money uh, immediately. And then a few years later, you kind of get some uh, interest back uh, on top of your original loan to the government. Uh, to tell you how successful this is, and, and I believe this is, um, well, I don't know. If, uh, all told, all told, out of all the war bonds that are sold, $100 billion worth, $100 billion. Um, again, that is separating out what America is doing from the rest of the world. No one else is doing that, raising that kind of money uh, to fuel our war industry. That's just not happening. Also mentioning industry, uh, moving down to number two, wartime industry. What we are seeing is that the government is asking uh, industries to switch over from making uh, civilian products uh, to war products. Um, so we, we saw this in World War I. 
I mentioned it in our notes, but uh, we are changing from a consumer-based economy to a war-based economy. Um, you know, automobile factories like Ford, GM, they're starting to make planes and tanks. Uh, they're starting to, to make Jeeps. They're starting to do things that will help the war effort. Um, the uh, Overall, throughout the country, there'd be over 200,000 companies that would switch their production uh, in order to make something for the war. Um, so uh, that's a tremendous amount. And I know, again, I mentioned my grandfather at Pearl Harbor, but um, I know on my dad's side, both of my grandparents worked uh, for Boeing here in Kansas City, uh, helping make planes during this period. Um, uh, so, you know, I, this, this is something that uh, America is, is going to work. And again, we're coming out of the Great Depression. So remember, 25% of Americans have been unemployed. So this is going to be a, a tremendous economic boom uh, to us. But man, there's just no other country on earth that, is, uh, that has the type of industrial power that we have and the ability to, to, to flip a switch um, like that. So um, I, I am reminded of just something I've read in the last week, of course, with the coronavirus happening right now, um, that the government has asked what companies that can uh, start producing things like masks um, to, to help healthcare workers um, to, to switch over and start making those. And I've seen many uh, have actually started doing that. So, you know, we, we do have that tremendous uh, ability to, to switch our industry at, at critical times of emergency. And man, it's one reason we won this war. Uh, without our industry, I don't know that we would have done it. Um, and then the, the final item for today uh, deals with rationing. Um, you know, I, I know I, we talked about rationing in our Great Depression unit. I had mentioned, you know, remembering my grandmother, uh, you know, taking a, an aluminum foil off the, the, uh, the leftovers and after she was done washing it off and then drying it, putting it back in the, you know, she had grown up rationing because she lived in this time. She grew up where, uh, you know, you, you didn't throw away. Um, you know, something that you could uh, use again. So, so rationing is when you are limiting uh, the goods you consume. Um, and specifically for this rationing, they're doing it for military use. Uh, so uh, not only would people save, you know, like uh, their, their metal, like uh, tin cans, they would save for the war effort, even lard, people would, uh, uh, they would actually uh, save like their bacon grease and they would make ammunition out of that. So that type of rationing, but also using less. Okay. Um, every, um, ha the head of every household in America got, uh, what was called a rationing book. Um, and, uh, for the start of my next video, I'll try to find, I have a couple, uh, here, but, uh, they got a rationing book and basically it was a coupon, uh, kind of a stamp that you would get, um, for the month on, uh, basically, to buy milk, you would have to produce a stamp from your ration book. That was the only way you could actually buy milk. It stopped people from hoarding food that was needed, but it also limited how much we were actually using. Um, beef, you know, sugars, fats, uh, all that were, were rationed. Um, other supplies, gasoline, of course, is going to be heavily rationed. That's going to be very important. Aluminum, steel, uh, rubber, okay, for tires, things like that. Um, in fact, kids would actually put together uh, ration drives where they would, uh, they, they would lead uh, scrap drives where they would go around and collect cans for the, the war effort um, back home. And you could actually trade them in even for more ration tickets if you, if you wanted. Um, another uh, final form, uh, the victory gardens. Um, you had many of Americans that, that would actually start uh, planting their own gardens to, to, again, limit the amount of food that they were having to purchase from uh, their local stores, um, which ultimately would allow for uh, more food to be shipped overseas for our soldiers. So, um, you know, Americans get pretty creative. Um, th this war, th there's so much about uh, this war. It's not just about the, the, the major battles. This war is won because we were able to mobilize millions of Americans. We were able to switch over our industry. We were able to use our capital. There were so many things that uh, went into this war. It's not just the fighting uh, that, that helps win wars, but it's the supply line. And man, uh, America's doing a great job of getting that moving. So next time we meet, uh, we will discuss some of the major battles of World War II and uh, talk about the U.S. strategy on how to defeat the Japanese Empire. And uh, I believe we'll leave off with talking about the, uh, the invasion of 
uh, of, of the German Europe at this point uh, and the invasion known as D-Day. Thanks for uh, stopping by. And as always, please feel to uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, I'd be happy to get back to you. Um, if you uh, Hopefully you've been jotting down some questions throughout this process. Feel free to email those to me. I'll, I'll try to check in uh, with a live video here later in the week. And uh, you're more than welcome to ask me any questions uh, at that point. All right, guys, thanks a lot.